Last night, I was derailed from seeing a movie by a pal of mine, Jay. We need a ride to a barbecue with an invite and his barter. Damn right, I could see the movie another time. We arrive at Lindsay's house, where her roommates were all running about, organizing the contents of 11 empty grocery bags. Meat here, condiments there, booze here, etc. I had noted to Lindsay that I liked her new home. It's much bigger, roomier, and safer than her previous one, to which she looked a little puzzled. You must be referring to the house on Nashville Street, because you never saw the other one. Lindsay's roommate finally finished. So, you know the story of the place in between the place you know us to live in and this one, right? Lindsay asked. I just stood there, curious of all the wide-eyed, uneasy looks, making myself wordlessly obvious that I hadn't got a clue. They called in the third roommate, Brianne, followed by Jay. They took turns at adding in their two cents, confirming little details, adding others, to which they all agreed upon as the story progressed. Rather than make this a back and forth story of four people interjecting, I'll tell it to you third person. On Carrollton Avenue in New Orleans, Lindsay had parted with her previous roommate and got together with two girls from school she didn't know so well. Brianne and Emily got a decent place. The place in question was rather roomy, in a good location, and above all, a hell of a bargain. This house, like most in the neighborhood, is nearly 100 years old. When Emily and Lindsay arrived to move their belongings in, they saw a note on the door, the furthest room from the front door. There was a note by Brianne saying that she'd already claimed it, which annoyed the other two girls. A blessing in disguise. Within the first week or two, Brienne and the other girls were all in the house together. Lindsay and Emily, supposedly asleep, and Brienne up all night, determined to finish the book that she was reading. At somewhere between 2 to 4 a.m., she reached the last page of her text and settling into bed to see if she was tired enough to sleep just yet. Note that the book was not a mystery or a horror book and that she had an elated feeling about what she just read. She was replacing the book back on the shelf and general before bed tidying up when the light above her started flickering, then went out. Brienne then turned off all the lamps around the room, leaving the one near her desk on. She soon found out that she couldn't sleep, so she sat up again and turned on the television, putting in a cartoon DVD in the hope that it'd tire her out before the sun came out. She heard a rapping on the wall and stood, not knowing if it had came from her door or her wall. Brienne lowered the volume of the TV Hearing it woke up her roommate and approached the corner of the room where the noise was coming from. It wasn't the floor. It wasn't the wall. It was coming from the closet. What Brienne didn't know at the time was that her deep closet shared a wall with Emily's equally deep closet. Not Emily's wall. Brienne assumed it was Emily who was knocking and crept back into bed. Again, the tapping coursed through the room. So Brienne got up, exited the room, only to find Emily fast asleep in her own room. Body splayed nowhere near the wall in question. She checked on Lindsay, who was also fully asunder, her room too far for her to have knocked on the wall. To do so so loud enough to gain Brienne's attention would have woken up the whole house. Confused and a little weirded out, Brienne returned to her room, closed the door, turned off the TV and the remaining lamps, and then reached for the desk lamp, which turned off before she could hit the switch. She retreated her hand in surprise, and the light flickered on. 
She then reached forward again, and she successfully managed to turn it on. The desk lamp hadn't given up on a life of its own. Suddenly, the light flooded the room. The overhead light blasted into life. Perhaps it wasn't a bulb that broke, but simply a loose socket. And in the few seconds it took her to turn around and head toward the light switch, became uneasy. Sure, it was scary, and the visual impact of the overhead light flickering like crazy was intimidating enough. But it wasn't without the realm of reason that an old house had loose light bulbs, sockets, even wiring. To which she'd have a chat with the landlord about investigating before an inner wall fire could occur. Brienne consoled herself with such thoughts as she approached the light switch in the strobed room to finally turn it off and put an end to this ordeal for the night. However, she began to believe the strobing effect of the light flickering on and off maniacally was making her see things. Or not. For once she got to the light switch, the light switch was frantically flicking up and down on its own. She would jump back in a panic as the strobing continued for a full few seconds, then stopped. Following a few moments later, in the darkness, was the knocking, making a reappearance, but much, much louder than before. Brienne grabbed what she could and got the fuck out of there around 5am. Not only not looking back, but too scared to even inform the other girls of what went on. It took a long time for Brienne to be coaxed back into the house, since no strange events had occurred since. Yet, Brienne wasn't going anywhere near that room, so she slept elsewhere in the house. It was suggested that Brienne slept on the second floor, since the weather was good. The only reason it wasn't used was that the landlord had yet to repair the AC slash heating units up there. As tall tale hauntings go, Brienne reasoned. She was going to stay away from the attic as far as possible, despite the fact that all the happenings occurred in the back of the bedroom that she once claimed. Weeks passed, and Emily had some visitors come over on one occasion, and Lindsay had some of her own on another. Neither group of visitors slept more than one night in that house, citing that they had strange dreams that they refused to discuss and they had an unnatural apprehension from going down the hall past Emily's room. Lindsay decided to investigate a bit, and entered Brienne's room during the day, finding nothing out of order. However, upon inspecting the closet where Brienne heard pounding noises, she discovered that not only did the back of the closet share a wall, but the back of Emily's closet, there was a sizable hole cut out of it enough for a child to pass back and forth. Upon closer inspection, the wall was shared, yes, but was hollowed. There was three feet or more distance between the two panels in the back of the two closets. Lindsay shined a light on the little space and found a large pool of industrial wire. She turned the light upward towards the ceiling and discovered this little hollow went straight through the second floor and into the attic. She could see a large beam stretching across, far above. Lindsay kept this discovery to herself for a few days. A night or two later, Emily was looking rather haggard, and explained that it was due to lack of sleep, since reoccurring nightmares kept jolting her out of her slumber. The other two girls pressed on the contents of the dreams, the result of which, much to their shock, all three girls and one overnight guest had the same dream, as did the two previous guests, when contacted and insisted upon the details. A very old, bald man was suspended above them, and wires somehow attached to his back, reaching up into the blackness. His arms were slung down, locked at the elbow, as to reach far down as he possibly could. His arms began to skin, muscle, and sinew, but 
gradually terminated into a cluster of wires. The wireman dangled above the dreamer, waving and scissoring his arms back and forth at locked length, as if trying to wipe past the faces of the startled dreamer. Finally, the man would buckle, as if a few inches of slack was granted from above, and the wireman would immediately and eagerly grasp the sleeper's throat with its wire hands and choke them vigorously. They could hear him smiling, the dreamer would suffer and die in the dreams before awakening. The vast majority of these factors were shared with the dreamers without deviance. The profusely apologetic landlord didn't question the girl's fright. Obviously there's something he knew that they didn't, and offered to send in an exorcist. Apparently, the exorcists are few and far between, so the girls popped down to some of the very few reputable psychics that were marvelously expensive. She got three to come on half pay, half favor. Remember, this is New Orleans, even I know a thousand psychics, but I only believe three or four of them. It should be noted that Lindsay was smart about this. She didn't mention anything about the room, dreams, or actual location of the house. And should the psychics wish to investigate before they come onto the site, Lindsay convinced them to accept the job with very little info as possible. Not all the girls were there when the psychic showed up, offering them nothing but listening to everything. The psychics entered all the rooms, doing nothing, until they got to the last room in the hall, where all three of them looked at each other in discomfort. One began crying. They backed out of the room. Lindsay took them into Emily's room and showed them through a room between the closets. Obviously, from the safe side, and directed their attention upward. Soon after, the band of explorers would find themselves in the dreaded attic. They had found the crossbeam in question. It had a deeply etched groove of wear from a once taut wire, and was indeed centered directly above that little hole. The psychics soon joined the girls in the living room and discussed what they felt. Apparently, a long time ago, a woman had run off from her husband and little boy. The husband refused to let the child go outside, thinking that he'd run off, and that the only way the mother would return was if the child was there. She'd surely not come back if it was just the father. One day, tired of the way, the father locked his son in his bedroom and hung himself with wire. We're not 100% certain, maybe in the little room. Again, I'm not 100% certain. Until, of course, he had died, assuming that the mother would soon come for the son. She didn't. The little boy died of dehydration in his room. While this didn't explain a good half of what went on, the psychic went on to say, well, there was some sort of torture. Perhaps self-torture, but I don't know if it preceded the man and his boy, or if it involved the man and his boy. He threw down many tarot cards, despite the meaning of the hanged man that we all accept. It came up every damn hand. He used 108 cards, and it came up every three cards after a thorough reshuffling. I think it's demanding a new meaning, perhaps an obvious one. I don't know. I don't normally do this, but certain impressions are undeniable. The landlord offered a second property, bigger, better, and cheaper, to which the girls took and presently live. The girls, when they think of it, did a little investigating, and here's what they came up with. Neighbors had seen six sets of tenants come and go in the last two years alone. Their pal Brian, who had several nervous breakdowns, including crying in class and walking around bug-eyed, in the year previous turned out to have lived in this very house, in that very room, for six months. Brian was mortified when the girls admitted they stayed there. He even recalled the wireman dream with eerie clarity from 
description. Apparently his state was improved in the time he'd been out of the house. The house is currently unoccupied. <laughs>